Hey guys, this is John. Welcome to another episode of the Meet Your Sticks podcast. As you can see, I do not have Austin with me yet again, um, but I've got something better than that. I have an industry prof- professional with us. Uh, he has 30 years of experience in the food and beverage industry. He is Larry Goring. He's the president of Process Systems Company and works with proce- or protein processing services as well. Now, he's spoken at Walton's commercial open house events in the past, most recently in 2019. Uh, he's born in Kansas. He's a process engineer with, like I said, around 30 years of experience. He's worked with beef, poultry, uh, pork, both in the raw and the ready to eat products. Currently, he helps smaller processing plants all over the country with design, uh, project planning, conceptual layout. He's worked on everything from Fortune 500 companies to our target customer, the small to medium-sized mom-and-pop shop. So, Larry, thank you so much for joining us today. I know you're a busy guy. How are you doing? I am doing well. As I say, it's another beautiful day in paradise. Every day we wake up and start doing our job is a better day than it could be. Have been so blessed so to you, be involved in this industry. So, uh, yeah, I, I completely agree. So you've been in it pretty much your whole life. Did you start working farms right out of high school? Um, was involved. I grew up on, on a farm mechanic shop. So learned very early about mechanical things, uh, in high school, FFA, um, then went more into the industrial industry, uh, bounced from a number of different jobs. And, uh, in 1984, uh, had the opportunity, um, started working for a company that, uh, sold the, uh, consumables like Walton's. And, uh, after uh, three years with them, um, ended up with a company that built the equipment for the plants. And they hired me as a salesman, but found out that I had some mechanical and uh, engineering background. And so they put me in as project manager, uh, which in that industry is project engineering, too. Uh, we were responsible for uh, taking the leads from the salesman, developing the project, and they dealt in a lot of the bigger plants um, where we would add... Well, back then there were big projects for, but from two to, to a hundred million dollar projects, add coolers, new kill floors, new cut floors, new fab floors. Um, so my introduction into the industry was at that level. And, uh, um, then that company decided to move to Cincinnati. I kind of got out, I went with another company for three years and then in, uh, 1998 started process systems and that's when i really started working with uh not only the big plants because of my contacts there but also worked with uh some of the smaller plants that i had uh, uh known and and used to call on when i was uh with that other company okay so from a small plant perspective because that is our target customer um what are the advantages of working with uh, a consulting firm like uh, Process Systems? You get a, a, a lot more custom design for your facility that's, that's uh, designed specifically for your needs, whether it's, okay. it's you uh, deal with uh, large uh, amounts of ground or or uh, ready to eat product or even dog food treats um each one has a specific application and equipment and and room and needs for that and in the industry um it would be nice to build a facility that could encompass all of those things but the cost per square foot to build a facility like that is so prohibitive so uh, i I think that's the advantage you get. Uh, You don't have to live with a cookie cutter design and then make that work. We can, we can design the plant so it's efficient. It's, it's cost effective based on scale. Um, and the flows are, are, uh, you're not crossing each other, uh, which gets into the efficiency, but that way you can basically start at one end of the plant with, 
with the animal and at the other end of the plant, whether it goes to retail or in the box, goes out the door. Yeah, that was one of the things I remember because I did sit in on the last time we did an open house here and you were talking was how important uh, flow is to a plant. Um, can you talk a little bit about how the flows between a, a very large plant, which I know you've worked on, and a very small plant might be similar or dissimilar? I think the the large part is that you you not having to back track any of the product to go through the any of the processes is important. Uh, food safety has become a very large part of plant design. As a result of, uh, we bring the animal in, um, animals coming out of the farm are covered with, uh, feces and it's, it's a, a, not a very clean environment. So as we go through the process from the slaughter or the harvest into where we take the hide off or we, we pull the hair off, uh, that that next step gets cleaner. And so as you go through the plant, it's, it gets cleaner all the way through. And when you get to the RTE or RTC, uh, ready to cook, um, that has to be, uh, uh, especially clean because there's nothing to, uh, overcome any, any pathogens or bugs, uh, with heat. Uh, so if, if they're going to eat it, as it's coming off of uh, the smokehouses or your your table, um, then that's where we have to make sure that uh, we're not sending out a bad box of product. Now, I know you've done both redesigns and build from absolute scratch. Um, which one, I, I know this is a little bit weird question because I'm sure you've worked on projects that you liked better than others, but do you generally prefer the ability, kind of the creative freedom to start from scratch or do you like the challenge of, hey, this is what I have to work with. I have to make it work in here and these are the changes we need to make. They both have their unique challenges. Um, the the starting from square um becomes becomes a a major challenge uh and there's there's two aspects if you're dealing with somebody that is familiar with the industry or has run a plant then you can be a lot more specific about the the identifying the scope and the specifics of the project um if if the person hasn't then it's it's very challenging because they don't know what they don't know. And I mm. really recommend that um, if they're going to build a facility in that particular uh, situation, that they find someone very early to manage the plant. Uh, someone to, that way, I, I, if I don't have someone that has that knowledge, then for me, it's a, it's a challenge to walk them through every minute detail so that they understand the decisions that are being made. Um, because I've had instances where we've designed a plant to do what the basic specifications were. And yet when the plant's built, they come in and they go, well, why didn't you do this? Or why didn't you do that? Well, you didn't tell me that you needed that mm. particular application specific design. Whereas if you're dealing with somebody that already knows, then it's a lot easier. Now going to the plant expansion, that pretty well covers that first one. Um, there's still, you know, most of the meat cutters and, and I, I respect the, the plant operators and, and the people who are doing this. I love the fact that a lot of them are multi-generational. Uh, uh, that's incredible to walk into a plant and see three, four generations working in the plant. But, um, so when you, when you're going to a plant expansion, they already know what they, where they are. And sometimes all you need to do is then explain to them the world that they could go to. Um, 
and then how that can interact with them. Uh, again, the economy of scale comes into play. Um, it'd be nice to have conveyors that transport product from A to B, but A, the cost of the, the conveyors, not only in the equipment side, but also in cleaning them every day, because that there's a cost that gets involved there. Um, the same way with overhead conveyors to push the carcasses through the coolers and through the uh, harvest floor and things like that. So there's, there's certain things that at certain levels can pay for themselves, but otherwise they don't. But taking those existing plant people through and, and, and having them expanding their world so they understand they're great at, and they know how to cut meat. But when you design a plant, there's every nut and bolt you have to do. It, it, I like to get that detailed into the weeds so that when the time comes to build, there aren't any exp uh, any surprises. Now, and thank you. That was a very good explanation. Uh, we also love working with multi-generational plants. It just, you build a better relationship, working relationship with the, uh, the business that way. Have you had people who want to bring in Con general contractors of their own, somebody maybe who is family or somebody who they know. Um, and can you talk about uh, what, if any, struggles that can bring about? Yes. <laughs> uh, just, <laughs> hey, you know, and it, and I totally understand. I mean, you're, you're, you're sure. from a small community. Um, the, you want to help your neighbors in that community. And I can appreciate that. The, the problem is, is that all of those little rules that, and I'm going to bring up, I don't know if everyone remembers the blue book. Uh, that's the, was the Bible of the old days when we had to have USDA approve the drawings. And so the little details like the coves and how the walls fit together and, uh, how they need to be caulked and, and, uh, just all of those things that are just, if you were to draw out the drawings to detail all of those little details, um, you're looking at, at hours and hours of extra drawing. Whereas if you're dealing with a, a contractor who has built a number of the facilities, um, he already knows those things. So I don't have to detail them out for him. Uh, I, like I was saying, the cove that fits into where the the curb and the floor meet. There's supposed to be a radius cove there so that it creates a cleanable area. Uh, that's just one instance. There's there's thousands of those little things that how it all fits together. Uh, another thing too, for an example, is and and I think a lot of the the smaller plants I've seen. There's issues with very low roofs or ceilings in the coolers or in the yeah. processing areas. Well, and this is my personal belief, but I, I've, I've seen the difference between the plants and have come to this, this conclusion is that the more square foot of air that you have in the room, the easier it is to control the condensation. The refrigeration has a lot better chance at working with that. And I'll qualify myself in saying that I know just enough about a few things that I can be very dangerous. Um, <laughs> refrigeration is, is, you know, there's basic formulas, but I recommend a minimum of 16 foot ceilings. Well, I get contractors that come in and say, say, well, we can put in, you know, if we have this, there's so many things. Uh, uh, the animals are getting larger. So you're going from 11 foot standard rail height to 12 foot or even higher. Um, so that means the top of beam is probably around 14 feet just as a, as a general. Um, so if you don't have a 16 or, or an 18 foot high ceiling in that room, there's no room or space for the air from the refrigeration to distribute through the room and cool um, the whole room instead of just certain spots. So that's, again, just one of those little things that 
if they don't know, they don't know. And so, uh, you know, they come in and say, well, we can save you some money by dropping the, the ceilings down. Um, yeah, no. <laughs> uh, yeah, not you're going to save money in the short run, but you're going to cost yourself way more money in the absolutely. long run. Um, so you said, you said in the old days, the blue book was kind of the Bible, but not anymore. Uh, we were talking a little bit before the podcast about this. Can you just, because I do think there is a, a common misconception when I hear, or I think when a lot of people hear USDA plant, they assume that that plant, meaning that the drawings, the facility has been approved by the USDA. They don't really do that anymore, huh? No, uh, it's been my experience and I'll qualify that is that when the hazard critical control point, uh, came into law in the mid nineties in the old days, we had the blue book that I was speaking about. That was the Bible. It was the specifications, uh, rails at this height, uh, the platforms this high from the, the rails this far away from the wall, uh, everything had to be at least an inch away from the wall so you could get behind and clean it. Um, that, those days were the days we had to take the drawings to Washington, walk the inspectors through the drawings, and then they had to sign off on them before we could modify any or build any new plant. And you also had to use USDA-approved equipment. So the equipment had to have a USDA number. So that identified it as a USDA plan. Well, now um, I designed the plants based on that blue book, and I still use that, that format for developing the drawings for the plant. Uh, basically, a site drawing, a layout, which shows the rails, equipment, elevational views. Um, then we have the, the floor slope drawing with drains and suggested sewer routing. Um, you know, those are the little things. But, and they all still follow that blue book, but um, it's up to the U, local USDA. So it's kind of a misnomer that people say USDA-approved plant. What they're doing is saying that the USDA will come in and inspect the plant. And then, right. but I've seen situations where um, facilities would normally meet, um, approval, but because there was a battle between the inspector and the owner, um, the inspector got really picky, I'll say. Oh, yes. And then yep. uh, we, <laughs> you know, the drill. We've seen it. So, yep. um, yep. We had a, a customer in Texas who uh, his inspector would not let him use a bag because he thought it should be using the Oxford comma when there was no Oxford comma in the, um, oh, what was it? It was the safe handling instructions. And he called one day when I still worked in customer service. He's like, I can't believe this is my problem right now. He goes, but this is my problem right now. And just that's the story I always go back to because you, you hear about uh, USDA inspectors and owners or operators who have wonderful relationships, but you do occasionally get those stories of them when they go bad and they seem to go real bad when they go bad. I think a lot of it has to do with in, in the industry, in the world, there are personalities that do not get along. They just don't. And I think a lot of it has to do with that. Um, uh, yeah, there's some, some bad, bad managers and there's some questionable inspectors, but for the most part, I think what I see is a very good working relationship. And that's one of the things too, that, uh, I like to get the local inspector or the regional inspector looking at the prints as early as possible mm -hmm. so that they usually have zero input. But it's one of those situations that they feel like they're part of the process and therefore sure. it helps them to own it a little bit. Yep. That makes total sense to me. Um, so you've done all sorts of, like, like we mentioned earlier, you've worked for Fortune 500 companies, you've built 
mom and pop shops. Uh, can you say like what are the largest plants? How many head an hour or a day? What's the biggest plants that you've worked the on? The largest plant that I've had the honor to work with is the Smithfield Foods uh, pork plant in Tar Hill, North Carolina. Uh, that plant, I was involved in the original conception of that plant in the late 80s. Uh, I was there uh, on site uh, in uh, nine, June of 1992 and was there pretty much full time until 96, working on that plant. Oh, wow. Uh, that plant is unique in the sense that it has a dual uh, harvest line. Each line at that time was, was designed to run at 11.06 an hour, and that's an inspection rate. Um, we always, one of the engineering things is nothing ever works 100% efficient, so you always add a 10% buffer onto it. So the actual lines were designed to run 1,200 head an hour. Uh, so those two lines, that's 22.12 an hour, is what that plant is capable of running at the 1106 inspection, which was brought back when COVID came in. That plant, and we started off with just a single shift. That plant went to double shift. We added on coolers and a blast gel, and that plant now has a capability of running 16 hours at that 2212. And there for a while, they were running 2,400 head an hour uh, on the self-inspection or the self-speed. And so that's 32,000 pigs a day. That's a, a truckload <laughs> basically every two minutes coming into that plant. And uh, was involved in that plant from the unloading ramps where the animals come off the, uh, the trucks. Um, Till the product is boxed in 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 combos or uh, shrink wrapped or vacuum packaged, all the way until it's loaded back up in the truck. Um, so I spent about six years. Um, about the only area of that plant that I didn't get involved in was the rendering. Um, I've learned that that's not a good place to work in. That's my own personal <laughs> thing, but yeah. <laughs> um, so that yeah. that's on the beef on the or on the pork on the beef side. Uh, been involved with some of the uh, the IVP plants, but the one that I was most involved in was the Greater Omaha facility. Um, I wasn't the principal engineer for it, but uh, I he was my mentor. His name was Dan Bolshaw. He's retired now. Um, Dan had me uh, working with him on that plant, and I believe they do what three fifty an hour now. Um, so it's that's it's, crazy. It's, yeah, I, to kind of give you an idea, to run eleven oh six an hour, that's a that's a hog every three seconds coming by on a chain. <laughs> Um, when you get into the 300 an hour, uh, I think that's one every 12 seconds or something like that on the chain for beef. Uh, it's, it's a crazy world. And so you have to break it down, uh, to where each operator can do what he needs to do in the three seconds or the 12 seconds. Uh, so for that Smithfield plant, it was in North yes. Carolina. And an actual so town. How many acres was part, that? On? That was. It started out on 160, I believe. Okay. Uh, right next to the Cape Fear That's... River, uh, the water that they were releasing into the Cape Fear River was actually cleaner than the Cape Fear River itself. <laughs> That's awesome to hear. Um, we just talked about a couple of weeks ago um, an issue with some wastewater from a plant in. Oklahoma, maybe can't remember exactly where it was. Sorry, people from Oklahoma. Um, so wastewater treatment. Can you talk a little bit about how, how you go about handling that from a, a plant 
design perspective? That is one of those other items that um, I know just enough now about to be very dangerous. Uh, I do, okay. I do okay. have companies that I work with that uh, specialize in wastewater treatment, site planning, and permitting. Um, most of the small plants, there's, there's usually two ways that it can go. One is that they go, well, now three. I, I coming to, there's a new technology coming in, in, into play. Um, one of the ways is you get connected in with the city, uh, wastewater treatment system. And so we work with okay. them to whether we put in a, uh, uh, a DAF dissolved air filtration or flotation system that helps to take out a lot of the, the solids and things like that, uh, out of the wastewater. Um, some of them we, I've put in where all we've needed is just a grease trap and the, the, the city seems to be able to handle this, the wastewater. Um, but some of the things too, and, and when I'm figuring, uh, I figure 500 gallons per head of beef as a standard for rating for a plant. Now there, that can be a wide range because efficiencies and, and how the plant is operated. So that could go from 350 up to 600, um, but that's kind of the number that I use and we're doing the design so that we can go to the city and say, okay, if we're going to do 25 head, 500 gallons per head, that's the amount of water that you're going to be needing to clean up and then uh, getting the specifications from them. Like I said, I have, I have people that I work with that are uh, highly knowledgeable in those areas. And so I kind of turn that over to them at that point. Uh, the other option, yeah. go ahead. Nope, nope. All I was going to say was you, you've said a few times now that you know just enough to be dangerous, but you also know what you don't know. And that's very much an engineer. Uh, my wife is an engineer as well. And she's very good at knowing, like, I don't know the right answer to that. Let's go to an expert. Um, <laughs> yeah. Because someone like me who's going to go, yeah, no, no, I read a book about it once before. I can do this. No problem. And then we've got a problem. Uh, some of you may be able to identify with this, but once in a while you, you do say that. I know what I'm doing, and it comes back and bites you. So you, you learn that <laughs> humility. Um, <laughs> the second way is, and this is when you're too far away from the city, is where we need to get into lagoons. And again, okay. uh, that's where I rely on, uh, the wastewater treatment people to say the size of the lagoons, whether we need one, whether we need two, uh, whether we need a DAF system. Um, so that's the second way. Um, the third one that's coming into play now is recycling of the inedibles or and, and the words escaping me right now is that uh, uh, they have a, uh, uh, they basically burn the, the inedibles. Um, and I'm sorry, I can't think of the word. I was just talking with a gentleman that installed one of those in Wyoming this morning. Um, so it burns it at like such a hot rate that it just, there's nothing left yes. but ash? Oh. So, hmm. and, and they, they are becoming, uh, more viable. Um, you know, it used to be that, uh, um, you just, uh, inedibles was, was something you send to a rendering plant and that's the way it was. Um, uh, in the same way, you know, with blood, with the, uh, uh, uh the viscera, um, the paunch, things like that. And in small plants, it's usually not an issue. But when you start getting past the 50 head a day plant, um, it becomes an issue because of just the sheer volume of it. Um, uh, you know, yeah. uh, you're taking, uh, 50 
sets of intestines and, and that to the landfill every day. Um, not a good thing. Yeah. Yeah. Um, and there used to be, a, a, or at least it, from what I hear, there used to be a significant more amount of money in some of those inedibles that has, that market has dried up. So you're having harder times finding people who are willing to take them. Uh, we can't even remember who we talked to, but it was a highway in South Kansas. There was an accident with, uh, an awful truck and they shut that thing down for, I mean, many hours while they got hazmat people out there cleaning it up. So, I mean, even just transporting it is a costly thing. So the ability to burn it off right there, and I, I know there's a word and I'm sure we're looking at trying to find the same word. Is it immolate? Immolation? Uh, right? Immolation? Hey, 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 Something like it's, that. It's there. Um, one other item in, in that comes into play, uh, it used to be that the hides from these animals were a another resource of finances, uh, five to fifteen dollars a head. Um, you know, uh, maybe a hundred dollars isn't a much to a lot of people, but I think uh, that's something that it's verified. So something that's happening in the industry now, it used to be that you would take the hides, you would salt them, stack them up on a pallet, and then the uh, hide companies would come get it. Well, EPA and issues there have pretty much burned the, the hide industry. Well, now what's happening in a lot of the small plants and large plants too is that we're chilling the hides. As they come off the animal, they go into a chill cooler hanging on a trolley, on a rail system. So they're, it's a lot easier to, to chill them rather than having them in a pile because then they'll, they'll, they'll right. uh, destroy themselves from the inside heat. But so they hang for 24 hours. Um, then you can, once they're at, let's say the 42 degrees or 38 degrees, now you've, you've preserved the hide. And you can drop them into a combo or a stainless steel vat, and they'll keep temperature. And that way, when the truck comes, you can put 40 or uh, 20 pallets on a truck. And you can get about 20 hides into each pallet or each combo. So it becomes an efficient operation. Um, yes, you have to build the facilities to do that, but if you're talking... 50 hides a day times uh, 15 bucks at 750 bucks or a thousand bucks per day. Um, if you can go a week, um, that's a sizable amount of money. So it would justify sure. that. And, that, and that's, so that's one of the things that, that I'm seeing in the industry and that's relatively been within the last year or so. And, and the, the hide companies huh. are, receptive to coming by and picking up the hides then instead of you having to take them to the landfill or or basically throw them away because they can pack way more into one the, trailer yes, yes. okay yeah that that obviously that definitely does make sense um speaking about things going on in the industry um obviously over the last couple of years we've seen with the start of the pandemic, there was the huge backup. We immediately started telling at least our our hunters, um, hey, there's a real good chance if you have gotten a deer and dropped it off at your processor this year, you're going to have to learn how to do that yourself this year. Um, backups at the big guys created way increased demand for the smaller and medium sized. Do you still see that same level of log jam? Is that clearing up at all? Do you feel like? I do not see it clearing up at all. I still am seeing yeah. uh, uh, plants booked up for a year out ahead. Now, several things that come into play there is that the guys that, that are booking up these small facilities are doing it a year in advance. Uh, they don't even have the cattle yet, but they're still taking those slots just to make sure they have somewhere to go. Right. Um, yes, there's a tremendous amount of, of 
of new plants being built. And I think uh, I, somewhere I uh, read a report that uh, 3,200 head a day are now being processed through small and medium-sized plants in the U- U.S., which is, that's a fair piece. That's one or two percent of our national yep. uh, capacity. Um So, but there's, there's so many plants that are in the works right now, um, that I, I see, and it was just, again, talking with the gentleman this morning about it. I see, I don't see that changing for the next five years. Five years. Wow. That is a a significant amount of time. Um, when we, and I'm sure people who listen to the podcast get sick of me saying this, but when the initial boom for our customers, the small, medium-sized processor uh, began. We said, if they can keep 10 to 20% of this business, it's going to be great for everybody. And it seems like they've kept on to the upper end of that 20-something uh, percent of it. Um, but for to have that load for five years, uh, I, I don't know if you talked or if you know of her, um, but we talked to uh, Rebecca Thistlethwaite last week from Oregon State University. Um, yes. One of the things she said, oh, you, she's very smart, very, very yes. smart. Um, there were times she had me chasing my mind around. I'm like, wait a minute. She's, should I even yes. be talking to her? She's a little too out of my league. Anyways, um, one of the things we talked about quickly, at least, was burnout. Uh, earlier in this conversation, we were talking about how much we like seeing multi-generational plants. Um one of the fears is these guys have been working nonstop for two years. Walton's has had a, a decent boom there during that time. Um, so, you know, we joke a lot. We're just kind of white knuckling it and trying to, to get through. But, you know, I still, I still go home at 5.30 or 6. Some of these guys are at their plants till 7.30 at night, night after night. Uh, are you starting to see a, a breakdown in in the traditional or not traditional in the the family uh structure people trying to get out of the industry i think the the work ethic of the families has always been something that is 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 uh, what i respect um they're they're up and going at six o'clock in the morning and they're used to those 12 15 hour days and that's just the way that they were raised uh, and that w- that used to be the way it was in the big plants um had a friend of mine that was a director of engineering he, he uh, 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 a short week for him was 70 hours uh, more to the 80 to 90 hours at a plant and uh, he finally through a a unique set of circumstances ended up out of the industry, which doesn't happen very much. This industry, once it sucks you in, you don't get out. <clears throat> so, but he went to work for a uh, hospital. And of course, with all of his engineering and drafting and things like that, uh, the hospital loves him and he's working part-time at 40 hours a week. So <laughs> to him, that's like a, a vacation, basically. Yeah. One of the things that I was thinking of while you were, were talking about how this industry changed during COVID is that I think America had a wake up moment in how their, their protein is supplied to them. Uh, I think there was, it was a a lot of uh, being naive and thinking that, okay, um, the big stores are going to always be there and the the meat is always going to be there. And during that time when, we reacted to the initial COVID stages, um, they realized that no. And yeah, it was, it's good that we can buy the inexpensive product with the efficiency of the big plants. But uh, more and more, I, I am seeing that the consumer doesn't care about the cost near as much as can I trust it? Do I know who I can talk to? If there's a problem, who can I talk to? And I think that's what is 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 one of the huge driving factors of the small facilities, besides the fact of having somewhere 
for the animals to go to. Because if a big plant shuts down, like when Garden City had the fire, um, that was what, 6% of our production capabilities? Where do these animals grow? They just don't stop growing. Um, yep. So having those local, and we've, we've helped a lot. I've helped a lot of, of uh, feedlots. Um, get started in, in building small facilities, not near what they produce out of their feedlots every day, but at least they have somewhere to go with some of their product if that happens again or if there's a fire. And obviously, you know, we have, it seems like now there's about a fire in a plant about once a month. There's just so many plants, but right. it's just something that, that we have to identify and alternate plan B. And uh, that's one of those things. The the plants, as far as the scheduling, is very unforgiving. Uh, with a small plant, uh, even the big plants, 99% uh, of the work gets done on, on weekends because they have their production commitments that they have to fulfill, and you can't shut a plant down. Once in a while, you'll get a uh, uh, what we call a four day weekend or a three day weekend because of a holiday. But for the most part, any work that we did a plant, I've done complete cut floors on plants that, that do 10,000 head a day of pork, of pigs. I've done completely pulled out the cut floor and put in new. We had over 300 men working in that weekend 24 seven and fired up yeah, on Monday morning. That's got to be an intense weekend, trying to get that ready for Monday morning. Let them walk right in and get right back to it. Um, the the creation of more smaller plants, in my opinion at least, decentralization of anything um, is a good thing. Um, I agree with you wholeheartedly. I think people started looking at where their food was coming from. Some people for the first time ever. Some people just never even thought about where their meat at the grocery store comes from. First yes. time they went looking for a ribeye and couldn't find it and ventured to their local processor, they were either impressed with the quality, the service, or what you said, they knew who they were getting it from. So there's a saying that's becoming more popular. It's the man with blood on his hands. And that's the person who's actually cutting the meat, who's actually selling the meat to you. So you can ask him specific questions about it. People are looking, uh, <clears throat> excuse me, people are looking very much for that. Um, and I think that's an advantage that the smaller plants have over the larger plants. Because if you buy a ham, bacon, anything from Smithfield, you're never going to, well, 99% of people will never get a chance to talk to somebody who had anything to do with the raising, slaughtering, or processing of that animal. Or where the animal came from, too. I mean, the, yep. the awareness for animal welfare. Uh, the industry has changed a lot in the last 30 years. Yep. And, and I, I would argue uh, for the better. Um, when we were talking to Rebecca last week, uh, we, we've talked a bunch on this podcast about uh, veal. Um, and then it was a couple of weeks ago, I was talking about it again. I go, you know what? Like, I don't really know anything. Maybe veal's not as like traditional veal is not as in my mind at least bad a process as i think it is it turns out it, it was exactly what i thought it was um but uh, she started talking about something called rosé veal um which is a veal that's treated way more ethically um at least from from what it sounded like um so there are strives or we're making strides in all sorts of different areas of this industry efficiency price animal welfare knowledge knowledge is a really big one um when we we created this what we thought was going to be this little informational website just called meatgistics and we did it so we would have a place to kind of post the how to's on some of the videos we wanted to like write out the recipes so we did it there and it turned into this amazing community of people who just want to know more about meat processing, want to share their knowledge about meat processing. Um, and it's a right now, the best way to advertise something is to 
uh, train your customers or to educate your customers. That's what people are really looking for. Absolutely. And I find that in, in the, the expansion or the building of new facilities, um, uh, I've, I've brought that up with several contractors that as you're meeting with these customers and I'm, I'm trying to, to kind of reduce my involvement and, and pass the torch, so to speak. Um, I'm old enough that I should have retired, but, uh, I love what I do. And, uh, so I'm, and I'm emotionally involved in the resurgence of the small plant. I, I like you, I think it's, it's a wonderful thing, uh, for, uh, without getting political living local, uh, knowing where your food comes from. And again, you've got two, three generations, um, that that is so awesome. You don't see that. You see that in farming. You see that in the meat industry, but you don't see that in a lot of other places anymore. Uh, so that's something that I think is Americana to the to the core. Couldn't agree with you more. Um, is there anything else you want to talk about? Anything you don't think we covered? Oh, actually, you know what? I'm sorry, Larry. I do have one thing. Um, somebody reached out to me through Meatgistics when they heard I was having you on. They wanted me to ask you a specific question. Um, this is a, a, a fairly small producer. Um, he doesn't have the uh, budget right now for a scalder dehairer, but he does have a small market for some skin on pork products. Is there something you would recommend for that? There's there's a lot of scalder dehairers that are coming into the market now. Uh, some some domestic, most of them are coming from overseas. Okay. Um, I think from a a uh, a financial standpoint, um, that that's a business decision that has to be made. Um, but uh, there's not a lot you can do. I mean, back in the old day, they scalded, and then they used a a scraper to scrape the hair mm-hmm. off. It's a very labor intensive deal, but uh, that is one option. Um, so I think that's that's his his two options is is to uh, uh, figure out the financing on how to get one. Um, and it's amazing. I was talking with a uh, used equipment salesman, and he is saying that the used equipment is just not there now. Everybody's holding it's on gone. or yep. grabbing anything that they can because, uh, as we're seeing in so many other things, and even in new construction, um, uh, a couple of months ago, I couldn't buy meat rail. I mean, a meat rail, the most basic thing in the plant, it's, it's steel. It's, it's just, I couldn't get it. I couldn't, no matter yep. what I was willing to pay, I couldn't get it. There was none available. So we're in a, a, a completely different world. Um, and I think in closing, I would say this is that understand one of the biggest misconceptions is how fast we can either renovate or, or, or design and build new, new plants. And because a lot of people say, okay, well, let's, let's just build it. Okay. And I want to have it up in six months. Well, uh, it normally takes two to three months just to identify this goal for the project. Uh, then, uh, I would say another four to six months to draw it all out and get everything detailed to get ready to to build and then you have to order the equipment and the equipment right now um i've got a piece of equipment that's four months out as a norm oh yeah um and i'm sure you guys are seeing it too is that and some of it is like for example some of the chain coming from europe is a year out um so uh um I would say if, if they're looking at either an addition or a, a, uh, a building new facility, you're probably looking at at least a year, um, 
from the time you start to where you would be operating at the at the fastest and and I don't mean to 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 uh kill anyone's dreams but uh <laughs> the the I, let me finish this with a, a little story I worked at that plant in Tar Heel and in the 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 powers would come to me or to the director of engineering of that facility and they say okay we want to build a uh, a uh, a ham smoking plant and we want to do x amount of numbers uh, how much is that going to cost me how big a plant does that take well it's not like you can wave a magic wand and and have all of that information right at your fingertips um, it takes a lot of thought and, and little details so that you don't miss something. Cause like you pointed out what you don't know, you don't know. And, and, um, I've seen careers get busted or people get fired because they missed a delivery because something came up that they didn't think of. Um, yeah. so as an engineer, uh, I don't, really like to to say anything unless i've i've done my due diligence so it's it's one of those things that that you want to make sure that you 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 can develop the business plan and the financial models and see if it works but once you start getting into the design of the plant the more details you have up front the better product you're going to have in the end yeah. And that makes sense. Um, and it's nice to see, like, I can never get my wife to just guess on something. <laughs> oh no. Like, how long did she's like, I have no idea. I'm like, just guess, just take a guess. She's like, no, I can't do that. So that is, it, it's nice to know. It's not just my wife. It's the whole engineering side. I, that's yeah. like that. We've, we've, there's a certain, you know, Temple Grandin. I, I, this is one of the things I really like. I worked with her. She's a very special lady, uh, but yeah. she and she's he's she's focused her her attention now on autism, and she has an interesting concept that we are either autistic or autistic. Either we're a flower child and we love doing art and all of that, all the way to huh. the the autism uh, pen, uh, pocket protector engineers those. <laughs> <laughs> okay. And I, it, after she came out and I read her book, um, it really helped me to understand that, that in that spectrum, the engineers work slightly towards that pocket protector in our world is, is as much as we try to make it as black and white. Um, there's some gray, but we we we're not comfortable until we get get it to that black You're not and white with gray <laughs> yep very very much so and um that is one of the more uh, interesting i mean they're all interesting stories in the meat processing like the history of it but hers that's something the last three or four years I've heard her name more than ever before that. So it, it's good to start to see that become a little bit more uh, popular knowledge of whatever that is, where more people are aware of everything she's done, because it is amazing. She's really set the standard um, in the 90s. I, I went to work for that company in 1988, and she started having her involvement right about that time. And, oh. uh, um, worked with her because I was involved, uh, with the big projects like the Tar Hill plant or, uh, uh, Guyman, Oklahoma, and a little bit of involvement in, in Triumph Foods. Uh, some of the other big plants around the country, um, they had brought her in. And so she stepped up the animal handling to the level that it really needed to be. Um, I mean, I, I do, I think that sometimes it can be over thought out. Yes. But, um, you still want to, uh, do the things that keeps the animal. 
and an an example, I've seen the quality of the product of the difference between the animal being stressed and not being stressed. Yeah. The difference, like with pork, the pale, soft, extrudative, um, the, the, the color of the product was so different when uh, we went to the CO2 stunning situation. Uh, little things like that. So having her bring up the industry to this level was, was absolutely wonderful. Totally. And I don't, I don't want to go too far down this road. So I'll try and keep this as close to meat processing as, as I can. Um, with those upgrades in that, um, from an ethical standpoint, it's made it a lot easier to argue uh, for the benefits of meat. When you know that animals are being treated as well as they possibly can, um, most of them have one bad hour in their life and that's it. Other than that, they're taken care of very, very well. Most of the so, time, it's a bad minute. Um, a bad minute, right? Yeah. yeah. Fair enough. Fair enough. Um, yep. And I, 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 w- I want to say this, is that in, in my experience, and again, I qualify that, there's been a lot of misinformation out there about the meat industry. And it's been my experience that the majority, and I'm talking 99.99999% of the plants that I've been in, I would eat off their floor, their sanitation quality, um, the pride that they take in, in their product. Um, it, it, it's, it's totally opposite the, the information that a lot of people had over the last 30 years on the quality and, and the safety of their food. And sure, but how much of that was formed by when I was in middle school, maybe even elementary school? They made us read uh, Upton Sinclair's The Jungle. Well, that ended up just being all propaganda. The whole thing's none of it was true. But it formed a lot of people's opinions. Absolutely, absolutely, and and without going political, yes, uh, and that was where that book came from. It was a political yep. ploy that was not popular until a certain set of events. After three or four years, the book had been out; nobody read it, and then the people used it as a propaganda to get their agenda and I'll stop there. Yeah, but what you were saying, the a meat processing facility in general is so much cleaner than your kitchen. It, you couldn't even compare the two. Your kitchen wouldn't be allowed in a USDA inspected facility. So the 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 level of of education in cross contamination alone in these plants uh, yep. whether it's restaurants, uh, whether, you know, uh, you, I walk into restaurants and, and, and shudder when I look around and, and I'm going, that won't work. Um, <laughs> can't do that, <laughs> but it, it's that we can't get away with that in a, in a plant. And like I was saying before, as we're designing these facilities, we're, we're an example is that now. It's, it's standard and it's not a requirement coming out of Washington. It's a recommendation, but we have different welfare areas for the harvest, um, employees than we do for the processing employees or for the ready to eat or RTE or RTC, uh, employees. So that way we minimize that possibility of cross contamination from the dirty side of the plant to the clean side of the plant. Mm. And, and uh, the equipment, I mean, there's, there's, uh, we've, even when I was with the, the manufacturer of the equipment, uh, we were changing design continually to minimize the, what we call the bacterial growth fields, um, where we bolt something together that is not normally taken apart to be able to clean. And for an example is that, it used to be we used uh, square tubing beams to support the uh, the meat rail structural steel. Well, okay. inside the tubing is a uncleanable area. 
Now, we can seal it, although to get it galvanized, and I do highly recommend, if you're going to put in a, any steel, you need to have it galvanized, except for the mead rail. Um, but you have to have it open on the end so that they can sink, so they can get galvanized all the way through. Well, instead of using the square tube, now we use the wide flange beams for columns because they're cleanable. They don't have that uncleanable area in them. So that's just one of those little details that the, con the industry continually evolves, you know, whether we use uh, a door spray systems to minimize the transfer of, of, of bad bugs from one area of the plant to the other. But like I said, the welfare, um, and it just keeps getting more expensive and requires more rooms. Um, same way with all of the doors that you have to have. That was a big thing. I got yelled at a lot because I had a lot of doors in my plants. Well, you can't have raw and cooked product in the same area at the same time. And as you get into the RTC and RTE type foods, you want to you there's there's now certain regulations that you have to have. And so you don't really even want to use the same packaging equipment for raw or RTE, RTC. So that's oh, yeah. almost a separate area of the plant now. Well, that means more square footage. So, um, it, it, and I think the public is learning that. And I, and I think the industry is beginning and the small plants is beginning to understand that, that this isn't an inexpensive thing that we're doing. Um, I'm seeing some, some numbers coming in on, on cost per square foot for budget purposes that I would have never thought we would be at, but we're there. Well, you've got specialization, and if you want to calculate inflation in that too, then the cost of everything is going up, specifically steel. We've had manufacturers, it's, it's insane. It is absolutely insane. It, it can cost you three times as much right now to build as it did five years ago. I am seeing bids good for 24 hours now and then they're gone then you have to go back and get them rebid you either accept them within that 24 hour period or and they're gone and that, 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 that price is, is gone, gone because that's how fast the things are changing now <sighs> that's insane that's actually that's a little scary, um, to be honest. We're just in that volatile a time in the construction industry. And yet, I, I my hat's off to the people that are, are sticking their necks out and, and looking at building the plants. Now, granted, yeah. the, the, the amount of, of money that it's becoming available from the federal government to promote the small plants, I think is, is a mm -hmm. wonderful thing. Um, and I'm very conservative when it comes to finances, but, uh, and I, I have benefited from those, but sure. I think redeveloping again, the small community and again, not wanting to go political, but it used to be the school, the church and the grocery store. Yep. And, 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 uh, the grocery store included the local locker plant because in my small community where I grew up, uh, our church, uh, butchered twice a year. So everybody brought an animal. <laughs> we butchered. We would then take it to the local locker plant. They would wrap it up or, or uh, package it. And then we would go pick it up or they would store it for us. So, um, I, and I, I see us heading back there. And I, again, I think that's a good thing. I agree. I absolutely agree. Any last words? That sounded ominous. Is there anything else you'd like to say <laughs> is how I should have phrased that. <laughs> I think that there's a good opportunity for this industry and the small plants for, like I said, the five years and maybe even longer with that. Um, uh, I, that, that word ominous, but I think as the world continues to evolve and society is what it is 
Um, I think people are beginning to understand the values of the small communities in, in the local businesses and anything we can do to promote, promote that and help that, uh, I think is a good thing. Excellent. Obviously we fully agree because that's our customer, but it is also helping keep all of us fed incredibly important work. All right, guys, thanks for listening. Um, if people want to get in touch with you, uh, if we have a customer who's looking to build a plant, wants to talk to you, what's the best way? I believe that in your catalog, you still have a little half page ad that has my phone number and uh, email address. Um, that was that that has been in there so long that Don Walton and I put that in <laughs> just as a a filler one day, and uh, um, it's been an honor to work with Walton's these number of years. Uh, um, quick little story, if I can close this off. Go ahead, Don. Sure. Yeah, yeah. Don Walton and I got to know each other when he was a purchasing agent at one of the local meat plants in Wichita. And I had known Don from listening him to the railroad. So it was an honor to meet him and we hit it off. And so um, I can remember when he came to me with the idea uh, of the beginning with Walton's. And so it's been a wonderful, wonderful relationship with Walton. So um, anything I can do to help, you guys or your customers just let me know and i'll do what i can we really appreciate that and that goes back to the multi-generational family you build better relationships this way absolutely it matters it really does hey all right thanks for taking the time with us today it's been a pleasure thank you sir bye thank you thanks for checking out the meat logistics podcast to shop everything but the meat, head on over to waltonsinc.com. And to get your meat processing questions answered by experts and enthusiasts alike, head on over to our online community at meatgistics.com. Waltons, everything but the meat.